Hey, praise the Lord. This is Clinton. Welcome to my living room again. It's evening time here in Phoenix, Arizona. I got a letter from a disciple in the country of Croatia, and I decided to make this video rather than write a letter to answer you, beloved, and this video is for you, um, and also for all those others out there who might have the same questions and, and might need to have these things clarified. So I'm going to go through the letter that you wrote me, and I'm going to endeavor to clarify the things that you asked about. Um, I had told you that when a man marries a woman, uh, that they become one flesh before God by the act of making vows to one another before God and men, and then taking the, woman, the man taking the woman into the marriage bed to consummate that marriage. And you asked me to show you that from the scripture, and I most certainly will. Uh, if we go to the second chapter of Genesis, uh, verse 23, we can see that God created man, then he took woman out of man and brought her back to the man in the covenant of marriage. And it says, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Okay, um, Adam didn't say that this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, in, in the sense that, well, now it has come to pass that she's bone of my bone and I see that. No. He said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, because he was making a decree. You see, God created all things with his word. By the word of God, all things are created. By the word of God, all things are upheld. The first chapter of Hebrews tells us about that. In fact, the first chapter of Genesis tells us about that. And God said, and it was, and God said, and it was, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let the, let the, the, uh, the waters above the firmament be separated from the waters below the firmament, and it was so. God said, and God said, and it was all created because God said. And when God created man in his image, God created man with the inherent ability to believe something in his heart and speak it out of his mouth and cause things to come to pass and enter into covenants. Okay, your word is very important. In, the, in, the, in these last days, and especially in the United States of America, people are very deceptive and people don't understand the value of your word. People will very easily lie. People take oaths in court and then they lie. Um, but that's why Jesus said don't take any oath at all. Um, but anyway, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones. In other words, he, he was saying, I make the decree that this woman right now, I'm taking her to be part of my body. She is now, by my decree, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, I take her to be so. That's what Adam was saying. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And these words woman and man in the Hebrew are ish and isha, which are related to one another. And basically Adam was, was saying, <coughs> I'm not only going to take her and cause her to be part of myself with my words, but I'm going to give her my name. And that's what he did. And then, of course, he knew his wife, and she begat a son. In the fourth chapter of Genesis, it says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. Um, later on in the book of Genesis, we can see how Isaac took his wife, Rebekah, uh, in the 24th chapter of Genesis, in the last verse, it says, And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So he, he took Rebecca, took her into his mother's tent, took her into the wedding, into the marriage bed, and took her. Later on, after that, uh, Moses was raised up by God uh, when the nation of Israel began to, to grow and multiply. Uh, Israel was the wife of God, and because she was so unfaithful, God made a provision in his law. That was that had to do with betrothal, and, and God instituted a betrothal period, which is usually about a year, where the the groom and the, and the bride were betrothed to one another, and they were in a marriage, but yet the marriage had not been consummated yet. And the marriage would be consummated at the wedding, which would happen about a year later. And this was a, a period of time to prove the bride to be true and faithful. And if at the time of the wedding the bride was proven to be true and faithful, then the groom would take her into a lifelong covenant of marriage. So rather than just taking her into the marriage bed and then being one flesh right then, there was a period of betrothal to prove the bride faithful. And that was because of the stiff-necked people of Israel. Even as Jesus said, from the beginning it was not so. Uh, but Moses gave you this commandment because of the hardness of your hearts. Praise the Lord. And there is so much in the Bible about marriage. The Bible is all about a marriage. Uh, 
you're hearing my cats rustling around right now. <laughs> if you're wondering what that screaming is, you guys need to settle down. Yeah, try telling two one-year-old cats to settle down. They're like kittens. But they're great. I enjoy them greatly. Um, but the Bible is all about a marriage, and, and I could go into so much detail um, from Genesis to Revelation. And I'm not going to have time to do that in 20 minutes. But anyway, this is what the Bible says about how a man and a woman become one flesh. It's how they become husband and wife. The man takes the woman by a vow, by the words of his mouth, I take you to be my lawfully wedded wife. And the woman, of course, responds um, with her vow, uh, which isn't written in the scripture, um, but that's what women customarily do. Um, but the man is the head of the wife, and so he takes her with the vow, and then they go into the marriage bed and consummate the wedding. A man's body and a woman's body are made a certain way on purpose. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it right now, um, but the body of a woman is perfectly illustrated in the tabernacle of the Old Testament. Um, and the holy place is, of course, her, her representative of her womb where the life comes forth and, and the way that the priests would enter into the holy place through the, through the, uh, the altar of burnt offering and then the, the labor where they would wash and the, uh, the altar of burnt incense before the, holy, before the veil for the holy of holies. It was all about the process where we would come into Jesus Christ and see the glory of God, and it's God created man in his own image, and in the same way, that's how life comes forth between men and women. The man takes a woman in the covenant of marriage, and they come together in the wedding bed. The woman is penetrated. Blood comes forth. Um, if the woman is a virgin, blood comes forth. It's a shedding of blood. It's a blood covenant. And after the blood comes forth, then life comes. the seed comes from the man into the woman, and life comes forth in the womb of the woman. That's how it works. That's how it was designed to be from the beginning. And so part of the covenant of marriage is not only the man taking the woman with a vow with his words, but the, the man taking the woman into the marriage bed um, and entering into her secret place and causing conception to take place, her life to come forth in her womb. That's why God made two one. And, and, and in Malachi it says, wherefore one, that he might have the residue of the spirit that he might excuse me that he might see that there might be a godly seed forgive me i don't want to misquote it let me go there real quick malachi chapter two blessed be the name of the lord 215 and did and did not he make one yet had he the residue of the spirit and wherefore one that he might seek a godly seed this is why two become one this is why a man and woman become one flesh that they might bring forth a godly seed. That's why, that's the whole reason why a man and woman marry, is to bring forth children. That's That was the purpose of it. Um, well, among many other things. But anyway, that's what makes a man and woman marry. When the man makes it out to the woman, takes her into the marriage bed, and consummate the marriage with sexual union. That's what the Bible teaches. Let's see, what was the next question that you asked? Okay, you asked about when people enter into a marriage, does it matter whether or not they're Christians? Before I talk to you about that, I want to go to the second chapter of Romans in the New Testament, and I want to share with you a few verses in Romans chapter 2. Paul is talking about the law, and I'm going to start in verse 12, Romans chapter 2, 12, and I'm going to read down to verse uh, 16. Okay, blessed be the reading of the word of the Lord. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. And then we have a parenthetical statement in the midst of a sentence. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. And the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Okay, the reason I read this is because marriage is a law. Okay, the Bible says in, in the second chapter of Genesis, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. God spoke it, it's the law. When a man and a woman come together in the covenant of marriage, they cleave unto one another and they become one flesh. It's a law. Okay? Um, it doesn't matter if you are a Christian or a Buddhist or an atheist, so-called, or a Catholic, or 
whatever you might be, when you enter into a law that was ordained by God, a covenant, excuse me, that was ordained by God, it's a law. It's binding. It's just like uh, if you're standing on top of a building and you don't know that gravity exists, or you don't, you decide that you don't want to believe in gravity, and you jump off the building, you're going to go down because gravity is a universal law that works all over the world, whether you believe in it or know about it or not. Um, when you drop something, it goes down because gravity is a law. Gravity is a law. Marriage is a law. And when you enter into it, it doesn't matter whether you know the Bible, believe the Bible or not, it is a law. And what Romans chapter 2 verses 12 through 14, 12 through 15 reveals to us is that the law is written in your heart. And even if you are not a Christian, even if you're a Buddhist or a Hindu, when you desire to take a woman, if you're a man, and you desire to take a woman to be your wife, the reason that you desire to take her to be your wife is because the law of God is written in your heart. You might be a Buddhist or a Hindu, and you might believe in, in the, the whatever multitude, myriad of gods that they serve, which are no gods. And those gods didn't supposedly say anything about marriage, but yet you want to take a wife. Why? Because the law of God is written in your heart, and you know it. And when you go to that to that marriage ceremony, you have that marriage ceremony, and you make a vow to that woman, and she makes a vow to you, and then you go into the marriage bed, it's because you know, because God has put it in your heart to know that God has ordained marriage between a man and a woman. When those married people commit adultery, when they cheat on each other and commit adultery, they do it in secret. They do it in the dark. They do it where nobody can see. Why? Because they know that adultery is against the law. They know. Because when they're doing, when anybody's doing works that are evil, they do it in the dark because they know that they don't want anybody to see it because they know that it's against the law because the law of God is written in their hearts. Now listen to what Paul said. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. Okay, if they don't have the law, why would they perish? How can you expect somebody to keep the law when they don't have it, if they've never heard it? But Paul says they will perish. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Okay, those that know the law shall be judged by it. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Now this is the part that I wanted to talk to you about. For when the Gentiles, okay, the Gentiles is a word that means that the people that are not Jewish, okay, for when the Gentiles which have not the law, and by the law, Paul is talking about the law of Moses, Okay, which is the law of God. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, okay, those people that, that profess that they don't know the law of God and yet they enter into a covenant of marriage which is part of the law of God. Okay, so by, by their very nature they're doing the things that are contained in the law. But yet they say they don't have the law. They might have never even heard the law. But it's in their hearts and that's what Paul's going to say here. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. It's like I told you a few minutes ago how when these people go out and commit adultery, they know that it's against the law, even if they're Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim, or whatever. They know, even if they deny the law of God, or if they've never heard the law of God, it's written in their hearts, and they know that when they go cheat on someone, when they go have sex with someone besides their wife or their husband, that they're committing adultery. How do they know that? Because the law of God is written in their hearts, and it is a witness against them. So whether a person is a Christian, or a Catholic, or a Buddhist, or a, whatever religion they might choose, or no religion they might choose, the fact that they're entering into a covenant that was ordained by God proves that they know the law of God is written in their heart, that they know what they're doing, and that they're without excuse. And when a man and a woman who are Christian or not Christian, whatever the case may be, come together before God and men and marry each other, they are one flesh for life. And it doesn't make any difference whether they're Christian or not. If you're not a Christian and you enter into a covenant of marriage, you have, you have entered into a covenant that was ordained by God, the law of God makes you one flesh, just like the law of gravity will cause you to go down when you jump off a building. It is universal. Okay? It doesn't make any difference whether you're a Christian or not. It's, it's good if you are a Christian so that you know um, how to love your husband or love your wife and make that marriage be blessed. 
but the fact that you have entered into a covenant ordained by God is binding and it doesn't matter whether or not you are a Christian you're still married okay otherwise if that wasn't the case and if maybe you could say well I wasn't a Christian when I got married the first time and, and now I am a Christian and I want to marry this woman I've heard that in the churches a lot well if that's the case then it, you could say well if you married this woman 20 years ago and you were both um, atheists let's say and now you've just become a Christian then all of a sudden you're not married to your wife anymore if you love her would you have to remarry her marry her again now because you're a Christian now of course not you're still married to her she's your wife you entered into a covenant with her whether or not you were a Christian at the time is irrelevant you entered into a covenant with her okay for when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law these having not the law are law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts okay which proves that the law of God is written in their hearts and that they know they know okay let's move on to the next thing you said could it be that every other union merge or coupling by any other system be it religious or civil as we know they are of this world falls in the category of sin towards God um, a civil marriage as it's called uh, falls in the category of sin towards God that's a difficult subject um, if it's any anything that's against the law of God is sin okay he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin and the Bible says the transgression of the law is sin um, for two men to pretend to be married to one another is sin of course for two women to be pretend to be married to one another is sin of course um, for a man and a woman to have a state marriage um, and, and have a marriage license I'm not going to say right now that it's a sin but I will say that it's a snare and a trap um, and I've made other videos about that as well if you're thinking about getting married do not get a marriage license you don't need a marriage license a marriage license is a trap um, and uh, the state marriage ceremony is a trap you don't need any of that it's a trap to get you and your spouse um, into a contract with the state whereby the state becomes the principal party in the contract and they own and have control of all the fruit of your marriage which includes your finances and your children and whatever else you may have um, let's see could it be that if I could it be that if I th think that I have found myself a mate before searching for the Lord for guidance I'm not fulfilling God's law but obeying my own prideful will and committing a sin um, I'm not gonna say that's a sin I will say it, it could be foolish um, to take a wife and not know that it's the Lord who's leading you um, I can see from experience that that's not a wise thing to do you should always let the Lord lead you when you are thinking about taking a wife or a husband but sometimes it's difficult for us to know if it's the Lord leading us or not sometimes we get a little bit impetuous um, so who knows if if the, the woman or the man that we've married is the one that God would have us to marry except for the fact that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God uh, to them that are called according to his purpose so indeed you spoke about the people of Israel and that they were only to take wives and husbands from the people of Israel and that is true in the days when Israel was a nation God commanded his people Israel not to take wives from the people of Canaan because the people of Canaan were idolaters it, it wasn't necessarily because they had to marry in the same family it was because God didn't want him God didn't want his people to marry the daughters or the sons of these people that were idolaters because they would lead them into idolatry okay so that's the thing now that we live in the New Testament it's there's there's no law against a person with light skin marrying a person with dark skin or a person from Ethiopia marrying a person from France there's no law against that and God doesn't have anything against that and he never did really the thing that God had something against was marrying people from other cultures which would bring their religious traditions uh, which God hated into the nation of Israel and defile Israel by bringing idolatry into Israel praise the Lord and so that that's the answer to that and I, I hope that I've addressed these things for you um, in a way that was satisfactory to you I know that you want to see these things from the scripture and I hope that I've shown you from the scripture satisfactorily I've shown you what marriage is from the scripture um, what makes a man a husband and a wife before God what makes them one flesh I've shown you uh, how that when people get married it doesn't matter whether they're a Christian or not but they're still married um, before God and hopefully those people will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ at some point in their lives but if they don't 
Um, they're still married. So I hope this is a blessing to you. Peace be unto you in Jesus' name.